one in 2014. And subsequently, President Karzai announced that transition would begin this year in poverty districts, assessed to be the most stable. Now, much of the reporting in the UK media and associated commentary has unsurprisingly But just as important to achieving long-term security in Afghanistan as military operations is developing the capability of the Afghan National Police. Now, this, is, this has received much less media coverage, but is no less important than the fighting against the Taliban and the building of the Afghan National Army. And the capability of the police needs to be complemented by building up the whole architecture of the rule of law, not only police, but also courts, lawyers, and judges to work in them and prisons for the guilty to be sent to, something we pretty much take for granted here in the UK. So we think it's important to close this particular gap in understanding. In Iraq, UK efforts to develop the capability of the police in southern Iraq proved problematic. But in the case of the British area of operations in southern Afghanistan, there's a multi-agency effort to help generate a full-spectrum rule of law capability in which British troops, Ministry of Defence police, civilian police and civilians deployed in Helmand, as well as the Ministry of Defence, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Department for International Development all play a part, which is in itself part of a wider multinational effort. So to explain to you what is being done in this area, we have um, Philip Robson, who's the head of the rule of law uh, section of the Afghanistan Department, and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, Chief Superintendent Paul Brooker, who actually serves with the EU police operation um, with their contingent in Helmand, and is here, on, uh, and is here. And as you can see, uh, the video link to Helmand, we have Major Nick Calder, uh, who's second in command of the Helmand Police Development uh, and Advisory Training Team, which itself is based on the Argyle and Southern Highlanders. Uh, 5th Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Scotland. Um, now, as you will soon see, although we've got a pretty good picture, uh, the video link um, is interfacing with the US Marine Corps' uh, command and control system. So it's bouncing off two satellites and a communication centre in Atlanta. So there is a bit of a time delay, and I'm afraid uh, Major Nick Calder can't hear what's going on other than through my headset. But he's going to begin, begin the meeting... Uh, by giving us a, a short picture of the operations of the Hellman Police Development and Advisory Training Team, after which uh, we will take questions, which I will relay to him, uh, and then we will shut the video link down and go on to um, Paul Brooker and Philip Robson releasing the video link back to the operation. Um, so, Nick, if I could hand over to you now. So, uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, as I've already explained, I'm Major Nick Calder, uh, the second uh, in command of five Scots uh, out here in Afghanistan. Uh, the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Griffiths, uh, sends his apologies, uh, but is in the middle of uh, handling over our, our task here. Uh, as well as being a second command of the battalion, I've also been the chief of staff uh, for the Police Development Advisory Training Team, uh, which we have just recently uh, renamed the Police Mentoring Advisory Group, uh, to better reflect the duties that we conduct out here. Uh, our task has been to develop the institution of the Afghan National Police uh, and concentrating in particular 95% of our effort on the Afghan uniformed police. Uh, and clearly we've conducted that within the Task Force Helmand area of operations. Uh, what this means in reality uh, is that the team were tasked uh, with the oversight and development of the AUP uh, from enrolment to retirement recruiting, selecting and training at the Regional Training Centre Southwest, uh, which some of you may have uh, known in its previous guise as the Helmand Police Training Centre. 
Uh, we also uh, oversee their deployment, sustainment, uh, continuation training, uh, all done within the districts of Lashkigar, Nadi Ali, and Nari Siraj. All of this is done in partnership with the Afghan Uniformed Police Chain of Command and is integrally linked with the US Marine Corps partners in Task Force Leatherneck. The Afghan Uniform uh, Police are progressing quickly, both on deployed joint operations with the ANA uh, and more routine policing issues crucial to the underlying development and perception of the AUP. It is their capability to provide security to the protected communities as well as core policing in support of the full spectrum counterinsurgency operations uh, which is on the critical path. We are also spending considerable time concentrating on making their personnel and logistic systems more robust and make them more sustainable and less reliant on ISAF for support. There are demonstrable examples of their progress uh, and I'll use a number of these to illustrate uh, their progress. On the training side, uh, the AUP's past indiscretions uh, are well documented, uh, but through focused training, mentoring and monitoring at all levels and across all functions of policing, the Helmand AUP are significantly more accountable and professional than at any time before. The process of recruiting, selecting and training existing and new recruits is wholly Afghan owned and coordinated. Through key leader engagement, district chiefs of police and district governors secure young men from their communities uh, to undertake the training. Provincial police headquarters screens all potential patrolmen and carry out drug testing and background checks. It is no of note that over the past four months, potential patrolmen failing the initial drugs test for opiates use has dropped from around 8 10% to less than 2%. Still far too high, but getting a lot better. Uh, indeed, during an enrolment of 400 recruits recently, uh, we only had one opiate failure. Uh, patrolmen spend eight weeks at the training centre where they undergo both green, military and blue policing lessons as well as cultural and literacy training. In many cases, the potential patrolmen come from hermetically sealed rural communities and of such they have little education and no understanding of Helmand, let alone Afghanistan. Therefore, the Ministry of Interior delivered cultural and literacy lessons play an enormous part in the development, confidence and social standing of the young men when they complete their training. Just prior to a passing out parade, where as an aside we are due to pass out our 3,000th trainee on the 11th of April, I listened to one of the respected Ministry of Interior instructors tell his young recruits that they possess the same social standing that he does back in his community because they had received literacy and numeracy training. Therefore, the opportunity afforded to these young men by joining the AUP must not be underestimated. Similarly, the enhanced perception of the AUP across Helmand province due to the local national interaction with well-trained, professional and increasingly literate young men is also taking effect. Training does not stop at the HPTC, the Regional Training Centre, and once deployed, AUP patrolmen and NCOs undertake continuation training at their checkpoints, focusing on the rule of law, community policing, and dealing with low-level crime. This training is increasingly being coordinated and led by the AUP themselves. The Afghan chain of command recognizes that development of more robust leadership throughout the AUP ranks will be key to the success of the future of the AUP. To that end, the Ministry of Interior has accredited and authorised the training centre to conduct NCO courses, and last month, a pilot officer course began with 10 students. These courses are heavily mentored and run by the PMAG, uh, but are increasingly being handed over to Afghan instructors and focus on leadership and more advanced rule of law and crime scene awareness. On the operations front... The AUP chain of command are also now taking more accountability for their equipment and personnel. I've been really encouraged by the strength and reinforcement of direction given by the Provincial Chief of Police and his District Chiefs of Police. They have instigated their own checks and balances to drive down corruption internally. In areas where patrolmen are still cash paid, they will not get their money unless they turn up with all their issued equipment, weapons, helmet and body armour. 
Provincial police headquarters personnel attend pay parades wherever possible to ensure legitimacy and that patrolmen are paid the correct amount. General Anger now sends teams to districts uh, to inspect the police to ensure that those patrolmen are at their posts, are correctly turned out and equipped. In short, they are driving professionalism and accountability and although seemingly small steps in the development of policing, they are giant steps enhancing the perception of the AUP internally and more importantly in the eyes of the local nationals that they support. And so to core policing skills. One of the most impressive developments that I have observed over the past three years, but particularly in the past year, is the AUP's willingness to conduct operations to rid communities of malign insurgent actors, but also to target more corrupt and criminal elements. Communities now report crime through a number of mechanisms, one of which is a crime stopper's numbers that goes straight through to the provincial headquarters. As a result of one such call about insurgency-related crime, in the northeast of Lashkigar, the head of security in Lashkigar uh, requested to conduct Op Zamare, a police focused clearance operation targeting criminal elements. Having issued his orders, his staff coordinated uh, the deployment of over 300 AUP drawn from across the district. The outcome was significant three suspected insurgents detained, along with a number of drug related arrests, weapons recovered and a significant amount of raw opium seized. We know that this type of operation has a hugely positive impact on the local population who see the AUP leading operations to rid the local communities of malign influences while providing close-in security. More importantly, it enhances the perception that the AUP are trustworthy and a legitimate security force. The AUP are now able to plan and conduct much more complex operations, both individually as well as joint with the ANA. Over the past four months, I've observed a very effectively coordinated security operation run and centrally controlled from the provincial headquarters in support of the national elections, as well as the Nowruz New Year celebrations in March being effectively policed. The security for the first music concert in Lashkigar, attending thousands of people, was wholly planned by the AUP and supported by the ANA and civic institutions. And we are currently in the process of planning Op Omid Haft, a joint AUP-ANA operation to insert new police precincts along the Route 601 to the east of Lashkigar. This will build on the successes of previous ANA-AMP joint operations, uh, such as the one conducted on the Bandybark Road uh, to the north of Goreshk. In all these cases, planning has been conducted with minimal or no assistance from ISAF, which is testament to the significant progress made by the AUP. Perhaps the most recent example of the capability of the AUP uh, has been the suicide IED attempt made by insurgents in Lashkigar in the last week. In this instance, whilst also dealing with a demonstration in the Bolan following the Koran burning event in the United States, the AUP foiled a suicide attack on the Lashkigar courthouse, killing one bomber, wounding another, and conducting a highly professional cordon operation in its aftermath. The success of this operation was rightly rewarded by the provincial governor and would have done much uh, for the standing of the AUP in Helmand. Of note is the fact that all of these individuals uh, had attended the regional training center uh, to the east of Lashkigar. Uh, so in summary, uh, there is much to do, uh, I won't deny that, but the continued development of the AUP is the future of Afghanistan. These sons of the community have been afforded professional training and returned to serve their community. Without their bravery, commitment and empathy towards the people, Afghanistan will not move on. The holistic approach to police training at the training centre is the centrepiece to developing the institution that is the AUP and is central uh, to the ongoing development of the ANSF. Um, that concludes my uh, brief presentation, uh, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions from now on, obviously, through the, the Brigadier. Thanks very much, Nick. We've now got about 10 minutes for questions, and I'll take them one at a time. Uh, if you could please identify yourself and the organization you come from.
Robert Grant, Wilton Park. Um, one of the major problems with the Afghan police in the past has been, um, well, high, high casualty rates and also uh, retention as, as with the army. Um, have, have there been positive trends on, uh, in, in those areas as well as the ones that, that you've spoken about? Thank you. The question from Robert Grant of Wilson Park is about casualty and retention rates. Have there been positive trends with regard to those? Um, there, there is a, a reasonable degree of, um, uh, of tracking of casualties. Clearly, we've uh, uh, been concentrating on the, the TFH, and I really only have the figures um, for the last um, six to nine months. Uh, I would say that uh, the, the insurgency has somewhat been depleted over the, uh, the winter months, uh, and there are, there are clearly a whole load of difficulties in tracking that because there are a whole load of seasonal difficulties that, that slightly skew the figures. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that um, obviously that the more counterinsurgency you have, the less um, threat that there potentially is. Um, it is still an issue, and the, uh, the AMP um, still suffer perhaps more casualties than the, the ANA and the ISAF do. Um, so um, it's still uh, an issue, but they, uh, they certainly over the last six months have gone down. Uh, with regards to retention rates, um, there are still... Um, a significant number of uh, personnel that um, go, go absent um, from the AUP. Um, but the processes that the uh, police headquarters now have uh, means that they're able to, tra uh, to track that far better than they have done in the past. Uh, and so when somebody has been identified as being absent, uh, then clearly we can use that um, identification, that, that PID, as we call it, um, to recruit new personnel into the police to keep the, the numbers at the, uh, at the appropriate level. Um, so uh, I think in general speaking, in general, in general terms, uh, both casualty and retention rates are going down, and I think that's a result of um, greater uh, leadership and coordination and accountability at the police headquarters, um, but also because of the fact that you're, you're training these people uh, and you're making it far more of an attractive proposition um, to a, a local national than perhaps was previously the case. Next question. John Rope, our House of Lords. Um, are there any other police forces operating within the Helmand province? And is there any contact between the training which you're providing and that that UPOL is providing in Kabul? The question from uh, John Roper of the House of Lords is, are there other police forces operating in Helmand? And what contact is there between the training you're providing and the training that's UPOL is providing and is being provided in Kabul. Um, th there are, uh, I assume we're talking about Afghan police forces here. If we are, then uh, uh, the clearly the ANP is the term used for the overarching name for the Afghan National Civil Order police, the Afghan border police, counter-narcotics police, uh, and all the other organizations that uh, uh, you would have, uh, you have out in, in Afghanistan. Um, so those are the other police forces. But with regards to uh, people who are involved in developing the police, um, I, I think may have been stated earlier, um, obviously you've got the, the UPOL, uh, which we link in and work closely with Paul Brooker, who'll be speaking later um, this, afternoon, uh, this morning for you. Um, but, uh, uh, and clearly he's our link up through the chain of command to, to Kabul uh, and elsewhere. Um, obviously there's the Ministry of Defence Police. Uh, there's also Danish police who come out um, as part of their military, a sort of tea, a territorial army engagement. Uh, and again, we, we work with all of those organisations uh, in concert to, to develop the AUP, um, obviously on the ground, but also in the training centre as well. Uh, I'm not sure whether I've answered your question there, but um, please come back to me if, if, if I haven't. I'm sure you will. Uh, there, was, there was some suggestion that there were going to be locally engaged sort of police militia in some provinces. 
Is there any sign of that in Helmand? The, the subsequent question from um, is that there's been a suggestion of locally engaged police um, in Afghanistan. Are there any of those in Helmand? Uh, yes, yes, there are. There's an uh, initiative um, called the Afghan Local Police, um, which is a similar thing to, I think, that happened in Iraq with the Sons of, uh, sons of Iraq. Um, and uh, at, at the moment, we're looking at sort of Tash Kiel's an establishment of approximately 300 to 325 of Afghan local police, um, certainly in the Nad Ali and Nari Siraj districts uh, of Helmand. Um, they are... Uh, effectively an, a, a police force light. They're a, um, um, a, a, local, a local force that's so secure and polices a, a local community so they can't, for example, deploy out and conduct offensive operations, for example. Uh, but they very much come under the auspices of the AUP. So they are, and they belong to, the district chief of police uh, and he's responsible for administrating them and supplying them uh, and giving them direction. Um, so although um, there is, uh, you know, thoughts out that the ALP is something separate. It's a, a different police force that's not within the construct of the a ANP. It, it very much is. Uh, and recently I um, saw the, the draft um, Afghan policing policy strategy um, that uh, firmly had ALP within that, um, within that strategy. So they are there, um, but they're, they're part of the greater construct. And I think we've got time for one more question. There was a lady by the aisle. Hello, my name is Sonia Markova from Amnesty International. Um, our research found that uh, police has been involved in human rights violations, and my question is, um, what are the mechanisms that have been put in place to vet that you know, recruits have not been uh, involved in human rights violations? And if they have been involved in human rights violations, what are the mechanisms for uh, accountability? Thank you. Nick, the final question is for, from a lady from Amnesty International, which is to do with human rights violations. And if I understand you collect correctly, what you're asking is what mechanism is there to screen recruits um, to see whether they've been involved with human rights violations in the past? And if they have, what is done about that? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the screening that um, takes place uh, when a recruit comes um, forward to join the police uh, is he effectively has to uh, arrive with a thing called a Tashkira, uh, which is akin to a birth certificate, um, where a local elder, the district governor, um, have signed the document to say that this uh, individual is a, uh, a trustworthy man and is the right sort of chap to join the, uh, the, the police. Uh, he then gets um, taken to the police headquarters where a number of other checks are done by the uh, NDS, uh, but also um, we, we biometrically um, test them as well um, to therefore see if they, they come up with any, um, uh, any hits within that, within that system. Uh, and as I've already mentioned in my um, uh, presentation earlier on, obviously they're given drugs testing and everything else. Uh, currently we have had um, some low-level, what we call, watch list hits, uh, whereby individuals will be barred from joining the police, uh, for example, if they've um, been caught up in petty crime, have been, been arrested by the police, and have been biometrically enrolled there, um, they won't, won't be allowed to join. Uh, I've never had a, an instance whereby uh, it's come up that there has been a uh, horrific um, incident, and therefore he's a, at a sort of higher watch list level, watch list level one or two. Uh, if that was the case, um, then we would immediately um, notify the authorities uh, and then there would be an investigation. Normally, if you're on those watch lists level one and two, um, there's the evidence there um, to, to carry out a successful prosecution. Um, but in broad order, the biometric thing, uh, the biometric testing probably answers most of the question. Um, and, and if there is any uh, worries with that, then um, they're, they're clearly not allowed to join the police. And if there's the evidence, they'll be prosecuted through the normal channels. Nick, thank you very much. I'm going to um, release Nick back to his duties now and release the uh, video link back to the military.
but I'm sure the very full audience here at uh, Arundel House were joining me, me in wishing you and the rest of the um, soldiers, civilians, contractors and police in your um, unique military formation the best of luck for the rest of the tour and a straight, safe trip home. Now give, give us a minute as the other two speakers join me here, and we also that's extremely down. kind. And, and thanks very much indeed, sir. Shut down the video link and to get some PowerPoints up. Well, back to a more conventional format for the rest of the meeting. And Nick will be followed by Chief Superintendent Paul Brooker, who is head of the EU police contingent in Helmand. Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, and good morning. Um, I think we just heard from uh, my colleague Nick uh, a reasonably comprehensive uh, explanation of um, some of the areas that we're engaged in uh, down in Helmand. So I'll just do a little bit then about myself and the team that I'm running and the UPOL commitment, looking both at the Helmand aspect, but also touching very briefly on the more national development that UPOL's involved in um, within Afghanistan. Um, Paul Brooker, uh, I've now completed over 30 years service in the Metropolitan Police, um, but I am a still serving police officer uh, and working down in Helmand. Um, I have some experience of working in leadership training areas in the National Police Improvement Agency and the National Police College of Leadership here in the UK. So stepping out into Helmand and working very closely with the military is, a, is quite a different um, area of business and uh, very interesting and fascinating. Um, we have quite a, a broad arena of partners. Um, Nick touched on very quickly um, the, the work that we're doing and the importance of leadership training and development within the police. Um, and whilst the police needs developing as a whole, I think it's important to, to look at that in context. <coughs> Um, we in Helmand uh, have worked on uh, leadership development ourselves, um, but as I said, touching very briefly on what the, the UPOL um, wider piece is, um, the key areas that UPOL have undertaken, very much in partnership with an organisation called NTMA, which is the NATO Training Mission Afghanistan, um, is taking the primary lead on the development of the National um, Police Leadership College uh, from Kabul, and that's to develop leadership at the most senior level um, and officer training throughout Afghanistan and the ANP, as Nick was describing earlier. The second uh, area they're working on is the development of a criminal investigation facility or faculty up in Kabul to set standards for investigative um, um, processes across Afghanistan uh, and to train up investigators, and I'll come back, back to that a little later. And the third main one they're working on is the development of a regional training centre um, in Bamiya, which is where UPOL has a contingent, um, and they're focusing on that. Nick talked about the regional training centre in, in Helmand. There are five being developed across the country at the current time, uh, but UPOL is focusing very much on that. Moving on to um, the organisational piece, um, the... National Policing Plan, which Nick was referring to just earlier there, talks about institutional development. And the reason for putting this slide up um, is to look at leadership development across the, um, the wider spectrum and discuss where we're trying to get to in, in terms of developing leaders. Uh, we're training NCOs at the lower level colleges, uh, and that's an important piece of the training on an eight-week course. But there is a recognition that the senior leaders, the chief police officers, the district chief police officers, also need training. And there's still a, a big chunk of um, officers, lower rank officers within that group, some of whom in Helmand have never been trained at all in any form of policing. And quite a significant chunk of those um, are illiterate. As you can appreciate then, that makes the training piece quite difficult. And what we've identified is that in order to deliver that training, um, it has to be uh, both a national approach and a local approach. That's to take the senior officers up to Kabul and to give them exposure to um, national training products, which talk about the strategic arena, 
and that's to look at training um, the lower junior officers more locally, um, acknowledging some of the challenges of training people who perhaps don't have literacy. A number of our usual products don't work when people can't read or write. You have to adopt a slightly different approach, um, which is about showing people how to do it, repeating that lesson, getting them to try practicing doing it, and, uh, and that's the methodology, which seems to work very well. The organisational piece and, and development that I talked about very briefly, this looks very complex and it's not meant to be, um, but in, in essence, the, the key parts of the organisation we're trying to work on the development, Nick touched on logistics, he touched on human rights at the police headquarters, sorry, um, HR processes, human resource processes. Um, the organisation is driven by intelligence and that's what the ministry wants it to, to work through. Um, it needs command and control processes, which is a policey context for how we get officers out onto the ground, how we control their activity when they're there. Um, and those uh, processes need good leadership to make them work, to make them effective. They then start to direct your operations on the ground, which is a, a mixture of different uh, areas. We call one of them operations, which is the type of stuff Nick talked about, about all, um, the ANP, the AUP going out and actually uh, doing drugs raids and things that policing would be more familiar with. Community policing, which seems to confuse people, confuses me. So I would say what we're talking about is policing the community. We're trying to get officers into communities, out of checkpoints, out of a security operation, which in some areas in Helmand they're now able to do. In other areas it's still much more um, kinetic and much more um, militaristic in, in approach, but certainly areas where they can come out of the checkpoints, that's really important. Response policing, which is the normal thing we'd all be familiar with, where you call the police because something's happened and the police turn up. They don't have great systems in place for that, but it is about seeking to develop those and make them better. Investigation, we've touched on that. I've mentioned it briefly. We do investigative training in Helmand. Um, and performance. Now, that sounds an awful Western concept and one I've been very familiar with in, with, within the Metropolitan Police myself. But when I say performance, I, I, I mean how does the organisation direct itself and how does it hold its officers to account for delivery of what the chief officers of police want it to do? So there has to be a notion of, of being able to ask questions of its organisation. Nick talked about their sending out um, investigative teams to check that certain behaviour is going out uh, on within the checkpoints, and that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. And then at the headquarters, we need those other functions that support all of that activity, the human resource um, processes, the logistics processes, the finance processes, which are absolutely necessary in an organisation that's nearly 5,000 people big down in Helmand. And the, the wider organisation of the ANP is growing around 134,000 people at the moment and may get bigger than that still. That needs a fairly um, comprehensive support network behind it. Um, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that you've seen um, the British military um, represented here today. Uh, another big partner of ours, clearly, uh, across the broadest sense, is the um, United States Marine Corps and the, and the US military. Um, they have a huge regional command um, in, a, in a camp called Leatherneck, which is much right next door to a camp called Bastion, which some of you may be familiar with and certainly have heard in the news. Um, that has a huge command centre which, which actually directs operations across the wider sense. That also links in with the NATO training mission which I referred to. So the partnership is very wide and very big and it isn't just and neither should it be seen as just UPOL or Brit military. It's, it's the US Marine Corps, um, the Ministry of Defence Police who we've, uh, we've mentioned as well. Quite a big organisation. I've more or less spoken to this. Um, what we've tried to do there is just articulate um, for the purposes of this the kind of areas that we're working on in the, um, in the police headquarters and this is Helmand specific. These are the areas that we're trying to develop and as much as one wants to talk about police operations it very much is about system and process. If we can't get some of these systems and processes in place the organisation will not sustain beyond us in my opinion. Um, so these are almost as important as having operational police officers on the ground. And there is an acknowledgement, an increasing acknowledgement amongst partners that this is an important piece of business. The most recent policing plan from the MOI has very clearly put institutional uh, development, and I think that means this sort of stuff, at the head of its agenda. And having talked all that strategic stuff, which I was never terribly good at, let's bring it all the way down to the ground floor, a visit to a checkpoint um, a couple of months ago that I um, took part in. 
And actually, I think the really important things to uh, identify here is um, it was freezing cold this particular morning, I have to say, freezing cold. Um, we, we arrived at about 7 a.m., and despite that, you can just see the tent in which the Afghan patrol lives, just uh, at the back of the picture there. Um, the lieutenant who was in charge of them lined up his officers, um, and they were all, all dressed in uniform, which was pretty impressive. Um, they were all there, and he was able to account for the ones that weren't, who were at the training centre, which was equally pretty impressive. And the warmth and the, um, the welcome that you're given um, by the patrols in these sorts of arenas, and this is on the edge of Lashkagar going out towards one of the district areas, uh, is really quite impressive. Um, the bulk of the people that were at the checkpoint have all been through the training centre, and, and I think anecdotal evidence from communities is suggesting that it is getting better. I think Nick said is it's not perfect. Uh, and I would agree with that. But we, we are seeing tangible benefit out of people who've been trained. Within the investigative training, I've got another slide on that in a second, um, we are trying to develop and sustain um, the leaders. And the point of this one is that um, crime scene investigation, certainly to a policeman, is pretty important. Uh, and the process that we engage in to do that. In the UK, Western world has a very, very comprehensive forensic retrieval capability and it's very complex. Um, the man teaching this class uh, at the front there is a captain in the AUP, Captain Aziz, and he runs a whole morning of crime scene um, investigative training based on his own experience in Hillman, and I think that's a particularly powerful lesson. And I have to say the fact that he uses um, uh, evidence of shootings, murders within um, Hillman province to uh, Afghan recruits um, has a far greater impact than us using examples of murders and, um, and shootings and such like from the UK. So that's part of beginning to hand that process over. And we are working on a program of trying to bring a number, a small number of um, Afghans back to the UK to give them some um, training in uh, forensic retrieval. Now clearly their infrastructure to support forensic development um, is limited, but nevertheless there's a lot that can be done um, and a lot that we can achieve in that arena. Investigative training. <clears throat> We've run five now um, investigative courses down in Helmand for all, roughly 12 in each course. That's about 60. Um, I would call them CID officers, criminal investigators that we've trained um, thus far. The last course was made up of new officers that had just been sent down from Kabul. Uh, and, and a couple of the key points I want to make here in this one, um, apart from um, the obvious fact that we're training uh, and trying to improve the organisation, is that um, another day in, in this training, Captain Aziz comes and does his forensic input, but is the um, justice input that is delivered by um, the chief prosecutor in, uh, in um, Lashkagar. So the investigators have direct exposure to the legal profession in Lashkagar and their interface between, in the UK we would call it the Crown Prosecution Service, but in, in, in the Afghan system it's the chief prosecutor and his office. And there are a number of different offices in the prosecution process. Some of them are government-based, um, some of them are military-based, and some of them are civilian-based. But we're trying to get the relationship between the police and the prosecutors closer together. And in my own office in, um, in Helmand, in Lashkagar, we have a number of um, UK and US uh, lawyers who are working on development of that justice piece alongside us so that we've got the kind of the both sides of it and the third um, member of our team out there is, is somebody who's a, a UK prison advisor to de deliver the prison piece. So we've got it kind of police through to justice through to prisons. And hopefully we get it in that order and we get it right. The last piece I just wanted to touch on is the work that's going on around community policing. Like I say, that scares a lot of people, um, particularly some of our military colleagues who are not quite sure what this whole notion of community means always and, and sometimes come to us and say, well, actually, were we ready for that? And so I'll come back again to it's about policing in communities rather than community policing, perhaps. Um, the notion of getting uh, officers out of the checkpoints, us going to surers uh, with local community elders, with district councillors, and those systems are developing the governments and political pieces is having great effect, and it's getting policing engaged in that. Um, that will improve trust. That <coughs> will start to engage communities in policing and the notion of policing more and more and more. Um, so there's a number of levels, um, committee levels, public engagement levels that we are trying to encourage the police to go out and be a part of. It's not necessarily their comfort zone, but they're getting better. 
and if we help them understand the benefits of it, then the trust piece goes up. Within that, um, you've heard mentioned the Crime Stoppers Bureau. We do get a lot of phone calls from people into that. Demonstrates that the community does want a police force that it can call. And the second thing is um, the community element is engaged in support of um, female issues, the female agenda. Um, we've developed an AMP female scholarship, which is supporting um, uh, girls through education so that they're literate and have literacy. And the chief police officer has accepted that if they um, go through that process, he will recruit them. And there's the development program for um, Afghan women within the, within the uniform police. Um, and actually, it's been improving to be very successful. It is a big culture issue, and is, there's a number of barriers there. But um, women have been deployed at checkpoints quite effectively because there's elements of searching that they can engage in that the, that the male officers just can't. Um, so this is having some effect. And that's a real quick rocket through and gallop through some of the areas that we're working in. I would want to just reinforce as I close the notions of the partnerships that we're engaged in and, and the fact that um, UPOL is a small team down south, slightly bigger team in Kabul, amongst a huge international community that are all working and trying to develop this and, and make it a bit better. Thank you. We'll go straight on to Philip Robson, who um, hasn't come from the front line, but is um, the head of the rule of law section of the Afghanistan Department of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Philip. Not from the front line and also without technology. No slides, no video links. I'm afraid it's going to be just me talking. Um, but I will try and make it as interesting as I can. Um, you've already heard from Paul and Nick a lot of the technical assistance that we're providing on policing. What I would like to do really is situate uh, the work we're doing on policing within the broader rule of law context and the work we're doing across the system. Uh, and I was pleased when IISS thought of this discussion and the title they gave to it uh, being ANP development and the rule of law system. Because if we're going to transition Afghanistan and get our troops out in the timeline the Prime Minister set, it is about rule of law. It is recognising that the police are the entry point into a system which goes beyond just the police force. We, we can see from, uh, from various polls that exist from, for example, the Asia Foundation that Afghans are concerned about security uh, and the rule of law. Uh, in many areas, such as Helmand, the police are the executive arm of the government. Uh, they are the front line of uh, the government of Afghanistan, and they are essential for improving, uh, maintaining the credibility uh, of Afghan citizens' government. So what does this mean, then, for the duties of the ANP? Well, I think it's important to emphasize that they aren't just a security force. There was a necessary focus in the early days on training policemen who were capable of holding ground, manning checkpoints, uh, and carrying out what could be described as more, uh, more military function. However, as I've just discussed, if they're to be part of the rule of law system, they need to begin to engage with their community. Uh, they need the skills which Paul has already described on investigating crime. Uh, they need to have an element of professionalism. Uh, and this all must go hand in hand with development in the justice system. Uh, if the legal framework isn't there, uh, there is no point in the police investigating crimes because they won't be prosecuted. Uh, if the prison system isn't fully developed, uh, there's no point prosecuting because there's nowhere for them to go. So the emphasis over the next four years is really to bring those three, uh, three different strands of the rule of law system together. I think we, we also need to be realistic about what is required uh, in Afghanistan and what we can achieve there uh, in the transition timeline. There are many issues, many of which have already been raised around literacy, uh, leadership capacity uh, and capabilities. The justice sector is plagued with or has many of those similar issues, um, but infrastructure and I think for me one of the, uh, the major issues within the, the justice sphere is, is the human capital. Uh, we've heard that police officers can be trained uh, to a standard within six to eight weeks. Uh, it takes longer to train a lawyer. You can't build a lawyer in six to eight weeks uh, training. You have to educate them over a number of years. Uh, you have to give them the professional training on the job. So it's important to uh, use the resources we have, but really begin to develop uh, what I heard someone working in HR in the Foreign Office describe as a talent pipeline, uh, which would be from uh, universities through to them being practicing lawyers 
and ultimately, uh, ultimately to them being judges. And surrounding all that, of course, is uh, the coherent legal framework. Uh, Afghanistan's legal system is uh, developing. It's developing from a low base. Uh, the legal framework uh, has been both complicated uh, and also uh, not always uh, clear. So there is a considerable international focus now on bringing coherence to that framework. Uh, and I think, as, as many will be familiar with, uh, it's a clear commitment that the international community and the government of Afghanistan made at the Kabul conference in 2010. Having said all of that, though, I think uh, we should not forget the progress that's been made. Uh, the media coverage of the police uh, and the rule of law in Afghanistan in the UK uh, is often focused on the negative aspects of the police. But there has been, as Paul has said and as Nick has said, uh, considerable steps over the, over the last few years. We're currently at a, the strength of 122,000 police officers. Uh, our target's 134,000 by October. Uh, the NATO training mission is uh, doing a fantastic job in this, supported, of course, by Paul and his team down in Helmand training them there. The training has improved, uh, as Paul has already discussed. The EU police mission uh, is, begin is delivering on its uh, agenda. Uh, recognising that NATO has the capability to uh, deliver a vast number of police officers. Uh, UPOL has a niche role, but a niche role that is fundamental to, to transition, which is uh, leadership and policing skills. We're also beginning to transition to uh, it being an Afghan system. For us to be able to uh, leave behind uh, a functioning rule of law sector, we need Afghan trainers. We need uh, Afghan policemen who can train their colleagues uh, in the skills required of their police force. Uh, so we're pleased that we now have over 1,200 uh, Afghan trainers uh, who've been trained the trainer certified uh, through UPOL. I think it's also important to recognise the steps that the Ministry of Interior has made under the leadership of Bismillah Mohammadi. Uh, he is a strong leader, he is a reformist, uh, and he's been very proactive in recognising the role that the Ministry takes. Uh, my, my background is in the Home Office and I'm, and I'm, and I'm not uh, going to compare the Home Office to the Ministry of Interior in Afghanistan for fear that I'll never be welcome back, but uh, I think there is an important role for the Ministry to play and without the Ministry playing that role, uh, the police force on the ground in Helmand or in Bamiyan or in any other province in Afghanistan would be unable to function. They are developing the systems and processes required to oversee the police, uh, whether that's resourcing for equipment uh, or whether that's the work in the Inspector General's office to make sure that the police are living up to the standards that's expected of them. And I think just to, to, to go off piece for a second, I think there's, uh, I was in Helmand in December and one of the really noticeable signs of progress which, which Paul mentioned at the, the checkpoint is there really is that you get the sense that there's an emerging sense of pride in being a policeman. Uh, there is a sense that it is, you are part of an institution. Uh, you are paid, you are uh, equipped, you have the right uniform, uh, including a slightly woollier one for the colder winter months. And there's also the structure around that. There's a, a code of conduct which is being developed, uh, which is enforced. Uh, there is performance monitoring, uh, very nascent, admittedly, but it, but it is there. And, it, and it's all of this which, uh, which engenders the sense that this is a police force uh, and not just uh, a, a, a number of policemen uh, patrolling particular areas of Afghanistan. The justice sector development uh, is, is progressing. Uh, it was a, a key focus uh, at the Kabul conference, as I mentioned, in 2010. Uh, and it remains, for the UK government, uh, the key structure around which we will be uh, providing our support for the justice sector. Uh, there are, there's been an increase in the number of legal professionals down in Helmand. Pay and grading reform, uh, which perhaps sounds a little technical, um, but is vital, has been completed in the Central Prisons Directorate and the EU are leading on it in the Attorney General's Office. This is fundamental to making sure that lawyers uh, are getting paid uh, and that they're being paid at the appropriate level uh, for the service that they deliver. Uh, there had been previous issues around uh, lawyers being paid less than uh, some of their colleagues in other areas of the rule of law sector, um, which is now being addressed through, uh, through this reform. And I think that the prisons work as well is, is, going, uh, is going apace. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, prison down in Lashkagar, which the UK has paid for. Uh, just two weeks ago, uh, the governor of the prison, uh, the 
governor of the prison in, a prison in Polycharki and the head of the Central Prisons Directorate was in, were in the UK uh, and described the prison in Lashkagar as perhaps one of the best in Afghanistan. Uh, it has a youth wing which is under development, uh, it has female detention facilities, uh, we're beginning to do rehabilitation programs, uh, which is vital, particularly when you think about the structure and nature of some of the men who, uh, who may be tempted to join an insurgency, uh, where there is perhaps not an ideological link, but just a need to uh, make some money. If they have other training and other skills, there are other ways of, uh, of making money. So alongside the rehabilitation program, the work of DFID uh, and our EU colleagues uh, down in Helmand to, to stimulate the private sector is uh, is vital to uh, taking those, those individuals when they leave prison and, and putting them to, uh, to much better use. So where is the focus and, and, and where is it going to be over the next four years? Um, the Prime Minister has been clear, we have a timeline for transition. Uh, we will be drawing down our troops uh, in a combat role uh, by 2014-2015 and we need to be working uh, towards that. So necessarily our key focus is transition in Helmand. Transition is uh, both the concept of providing security, so the Afghans are providing security for Helmandis, uh, but there is also the non-security elements of that, the, uh, the transformation section of transition as it's, uh, as it's beginning to be classified. Uh, and this is rule of law, this is governance, this is economic and, and social development. However, all of the development in, in Helmand uh, can't sustain and can't survive if the structures aren't in place in Kabul. The work in the line ministries is absolutely vital. The work of the EU and the World Bank to develop uh, public administration reform, to provide civil servants uh, for those ministries uh, is as vital uh, to, sus to sustaining transition as training the police force or the justice officials themselves. The framework for all of this is the Kabul conference uh, commitments that were made uh, in, in June, in July uh, last year. Those were focusing on accelerating Afghanistan's ability to govern itself, uh, to reduce its dependency on the international community, uh, to enhance their security forces, and to provide better protection for the rights of its citizens. It had important specific uh, commitments on rule of law, as I've mentioned, uh, anti-corruption, which I'm sure is an issue that uh, everybody thinks about when they think about Afghanistan, uh, and economic and social development. And, and I think that the, the key phrase, uh, which, I, which I think brings together those commitments and, and drives the UK's engagement on rule of law, is access to justice. Uh, access to justice isn't just about a police force. Uh, it is about a, just a judicial system which can both present a proper case, can present the evidence against an individual, but also can provide defence lawyers. Uh, we are increasing, our, we are spending money on uh, providing defence lawyers and paralegals uh, down in Helmand. Uh, defence lawyers are as vital to a functioning legal system as good prosecutors. If I, just to provide a little more detail on the specifics of our activity, uh, we are a, a major contributor to UPOL. We have Paul down in Helmand. Uh, we have 19 senior police officers in key positions in UPOL, including uh, the deputy head of mission. Uh, we also take the lead on the role in the Inspector General's office in uh, the, Ministry, the Ministry of Interior uh, and are uh, taking an important role in the uh, leadership, uh, leadership training mission in Kabul. We second civilian police officers and military to NTMA in Kabul. Uh, and we also make contributions to the UN-administered LOTFA fund, the Law and Order uh, LOTFA fund, excuse me, a, a moment of uh, forgetting what the T means uh, in, in LOTFA, but the LOTFA fund to manage uh, police salaries. Uh, and in April this month, DFID will, begin, will start a four-year programme uh, spending £7 million in the Ministry of Interior to, to, pr to improve the capacity to manage uh, and hold the police to account. Uh, and begin to develop and support the World Bank and, and NATO in the ministry uh, on developing those civil servants. I think, I think I've, I've, I've covered most of the points which, uh, which I would like to, but I, I think that the key message which I would like to, uh, to leave people with is really that we need to be realistic about what we can achieve in Afghanistan, but we need to be relentless in the pursuit of what we would like to achieve. 
there is an absolute requirement that the rule of law system can provide the necessary services to the citizens of Afghanistan and that needs to be the police, that needs to be the justice system and that needs to be the prisons. Uh, it is and it will remain uh, a focus of, uh, of the UK government uh, during the process towards transition uh, and we will continue to work with uh, our international partners, uh, the Americans, uh, the EU, the World Bank, uh, throughout all of this process. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. We've got time for some questions. Again, would you please identify yourself and um, the organisation you speak for? Thank you. Um, Dan Fox from the Institute for Security and Resilience Studies at uh, UCL. Um, on, on the question of salaries, there were reports last year of Afghan policemen, a pilot project for Afghan policemen, to get paid directly through their salaries being credited to their mobile phones, I think. I, I'm just wondering if that's been successful, if that's working, if that's having the aim that it uh, had, uh, it, if it's having a successful aim of stopping, through corruption, their money's been le leaking out. Um, I could perhaps give the, the national picture and Paul, I don't know if you wanted to deal a little bit with Helmand. Um, yes, you're right, it was one of the means of, of making sure that uh, salaries got down to, to the officers, uh, whether that's a provincial chief of policemen or a patrolman at a uh, checkpoint. Um, increasingly, through, uh, through the work of the UN, uh, police salaries are being distributed directly into bank accounts. Uh, so in the more developed areas, we're able to electronically transfer funds. Um, I think we stand at around 60-70% uh, of 80% uh, of salaries being administered in this way. Uh, unfortunately, as you're all aware, Afghanistan uh, contains many areas where you may not find a cash point uh, at the corner of your street. Uh, and where we're unable to provide uh, direct transfers, we still use the mobile phone system, um, which works well, which enables officers to uh, understand how much they're supposed to be paid, see that they have been paid, uh, and then to go and collect their money from, uh, from a trusted agent uh, who is monitored uh, by the international community. Lady over there. Maya Pastark here for Amnesty International. Um, I'd just like to ask what the percentage of women police recruits are um, in the AMP and also what um, the government is doing to improve access to justice for women in the formal sector. Um, because, as you know, the police and judicial authorities seldom address their complaints relating to physical and sexual violence. Perhaps start with you, Paul. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't know what the percentage is, uh, absolutely. I know we've got um, 17 um, women who have been mentored by um, a colleague from the MDP um, down in Lashkagar. Um, there is a drive, and it comes from the Ministry, to improve the representation of women in the organisation. Um, but there is always the challenge of the literacy piece, which is why we've set up the female scholarship to try and um, support women through that process to make sure that they have literacy and are able to be recruited into the organisation, and it is a challenge. Um, increasing female access to justice in an, in an area where culturally this isn't necessarily something that people are that comfortable to do is a challenge. We have in our own office a, um, uh, an advisor who's been recruited with the sole intention um, of trying to develop cultural awareness and um, bring to local communities, I guess, the, um, the idea that actually valuing human rights for women um, and the rights of women is very important. Um, and that individual, Leila, um, has a lot of experience um, around uh, other parts of the world in, in delivering this. So there's a lot of work that goes on, as well as the uh, mentoring of police officers on the ground, to, to make sure that officers do take those issues um, seriously. But I wouldn't want to kind of minimise the strength uh, or the amount of the challenge that that presents, because culturally it isn't necessarily seen in that way. So we're pushing quite hard, um, as, as much as we can, to push that agenda forward as quickly as possible. Um, unfortunately, it takes time. We'd all like to see that agenda going quicker, but it's, it's, it is a challenge. Philip? Um, yes, there, is, uh, there has been an increase, a marked increase, actually, in the number of, uh, of female police officers. Um, it's been around 45% uh, since 2009 uh, to 2010 last year. Uh, we now have around 1,000 female officers in the ANP. Um, and I think within that, it's, it's important to recognise the roles that, that uh, female ANP officers play. We have three... Uh, Brigadier Generals uh, in the ANP who are female. 
Uh, so they are, uh, female officers exist uh, throughout the structure uh, and at many different ranks. Uh, also, last year in Jalalabad, uh, a women's training centre was opened and trained last year uh, 458 female police officers. Um, regarding female uh, access to justice, uh, Paul's absolutely right. Uh, it's very challenging. It's, a, it's uh, an area that uh, we aren't put off by by the fact that it is challenging and we are uh, focused on improving that access to justice. Um, there has been a lot of work, particularly on domestic violence um, and improving uh, the ability of the police to investigate domestic violence or support for women's shelters uh, throughout Afghanistan. Um, and, and, it, and it will remain uh, one of the issues that we will continue to focus on uh, over the next four years. Uh, Desmond Byrne at the back. <coughs> Thanks so much, Desmond Burden, um, mm -hmm. the Institute. Uh, two quick questions. What about corruption? I mean, the police used to be, you know, it used to be a byword for, for corruption. And indeed, you know, the average Afghan encountering you know, a form of, of Afghan government would come across the police and the police would you know, demand uh, bribes. I mean, has that really been you know, conquered and dealt with? And, and if so, I mean, so much of it has, but the you know, question there about just how effective that is. Second, um, and, and really I'll ask for a sort of personal Here we are in 2011. Um, the involvement uh, was started in 2001, two with the setting up of, of ISAF. Um, it's taken us that you know close on 10 years to get to the point where we have a, a deep, what sounds like a decent police program. You know, is this something actually that we should have invested in a lot earlier, and maybe one of the very first things that we should have invested in, rather than those work that we can have to sort of deal with? I'll we'll start with you. Maybe. Um, corruption. Okay, corruption piece. Um, Can we speak on the yes. Is there still corruption? Yes. Um, is it going to go away uh, immediately anytime soon? I shouldn't think so um, because it's a challenge um, in that organisation. People haven't necessarily had good pay, haven't necessarily had good conditions, um, and that's a, a matter of doing business out in that part of the world. Is it getting better? I firmly believe it is. Um, we're getting reports now back from communities to say, quite surprised sometimes, to say, actually I was stopped at a checkpoint or I went through the checkpoint and that actually the officers were reasonably polite and I didn't get fined. So there is improvement. There is improvement. Are we still going to see pockets of it? Of course. I think it would be naive to, see, to think otherwise. But the, the training um, where it is, is very robustly reinforced, the messages about um, the standings and the protocols and the and the integrity that the organisation is expected to adopt and behave by, its values, which is very clearly articulated, are reinforced time and time again. That's very, very strongly pushed by the MOI uh, and through the officer uh, level and grades. Um, and of course the mentoring that we're engaged with, um, with our military colleagues out on the ground also is reinforcing those messages. Um, so as much as can be done, I think is being done to, um, to try and um, I think eradicate is a very strong word, but to try and uh, minimise, limit, and make it a more professional organisation. And I think Phil mentioned earlier <coughs> about the fact a sense, a growing sense of professionalising uh, the organisation and that people are professional police officers. And in time, and it's almost like a tipping point, um, it'll start to self-control. Um, and at the moment, we're doing a lot uh, to try and mentor it that that, that, that behaviour is unacceptable. And if they want to trust, um, and they want that um, respect in the community, then they've got to challenge these behaviours in internally as well as us pushing them externally. Personal view, I'm just going to say one thing on the personal view about the development should we have done. All I, I'm going to say is, is that I see a lot because of the way the military system works and they rip out every six months on the Brit side, every year on the US side. I see a lot of um, uh, experienced officers and troops coming back into the theatre who've been there before. And, and what the constant messaging from them is, is I was here in 2008 or I was here in 2006 and it takes you to go away and come back again to see how much it's changed and how fundamentally it di different it is to when I was last serving out there. I don't get that vision because I see it kind of up, up front and face on all of the time. And I think for me that's probably the best measure of whether we're going forward or not. Philip? Uh, I think just, just on the corruption point to, to re-emphasise what Paul has said, um, I think... Uh, 
uh, we will never conquer it, as, as, as you put in, in your question. Um, I think it's about uh, getting it to such a level that it doesn't affect the viability of the state. So it's, yeah. uh, it's dealing with it at its most serious end where it affects state viability, uh, or dealing with it even at the more minor end where it can have an impact on, on state viability. And, and that is done through the, the structures and systems which, uh, which Paul has already set out. Um, on whether we should have started earlier, it's a very good question. And I, th I think uh, what, we, what we have seen is that the police development, perhaps in the early days, uh, suffered a little bit uh, due to the prioritization of the army development. Uh, the Afghan National Army is uh, a, very fun a very functional body. It's, it's, uh, it's advanced, it's able to man its own operations, and it was able to do that much earlier than the, the police force uh, has been able to do. Um, however, we have seen uh, the important prioritisation of the police. Uh, General, Petre General McChrystal, when he came in, uh, stated that the police was one of his priorities. General Petraeus has continued with, uh, with that. And indeed, uh, the sense is that General Petraeus uh, now sees the police as, as this part of the rule of law system. So it is an evolving process from uh, recognising that the army was going to be the, the initial security force able to uh, apply the pressure on the insurgency and that the police force would require the development within, uh, within the bubble that the, the army, whether that's the Afghan army or, uh, or ISAF, uh, would be able to provide the, uh, the important policing service, which is, in terms of transition, uh, as vital as, uh, as the function that the army uh, undertakes. I've got time for one more brief question. Yes, lady in the grey. Um, let me go to the strengths first, I guess. The, I mean, the primary strengths for the military, from my perspective, are that they can get out there. Um, the military skill set enables them to go out into, and in some places, um, a reasonably kinetic environment and operate. Um, frankly, civil policing, with my skill set, can't do that, or at least not easily. Um, so we're always going to have to work with the military in that, or alongside them, or sometimes a little bit more remotely, slightly behind them. Um, because that's their strength. The other strengths that the military have got is they're an organisation, they understand command and control, they understand delivery, they understand some of the other processes that we talked around institutions. Um, so there's uh, a lot of advantage there. They're um, particularly good at logistics, um, and that's a huge challenge. So there is a huge number of strengths in, in that regard. What's the weakness? I'm not sure if it's a weakness per se, but what's the difference is that clearly a soldier's a soldier and a cop's a cop. And from my point of view, they're constitutionally different. Um, and with the best will in the world, you're not going to turn somebody who's green-blue and vice versa, or not without some substantial training programs and processes. So what I think we've achieved and, um, uh, and I think we've, we've, we've gripped is that we need both together in order to take this forward in, in the best way possible. Ideally, I'd turn it solely into policing. But the reality, certainly down in Helmand, is that that's just not practical at the moment, given um, the pockets of areas where the security really is still quite difficult. In the areas where security is improving, and it is improving quite significantly, we can increase that kind of the blue shirt representation within the military teams. But I mean, I think if we throw our minds back to Northern Ireland, it was, it was for many years that the, the organisations, and I mean the both of them, were quite used to working, you know, policing, delivered policing, but within a, within a military bubble, which sort of provided the outer perimeter of security, if you will. Uh, and in many respects, I'm not trying to compare Northern Ireland with, with Afghanistan, but in many respects that kind of operating protocol is not dissimilar. Um, and if we can build up the, the civil police bit operating within that military bubble, then I think that that's probably very good and the right way forward. But actually the two, the two institutions, ironically, do seem to complement each other quite well. And um, there's a certain amount of banter you wouldn't be surprised to know. <laughs> well, I'd like to um, draw stumps then. Um, it does strike me, though, that... Um, We've got a very wide and eclectic audience today, but I don't think we've actually got any serving or retired police in the audience as opposed to on the podium. There we have. Excellent. Thank you. Um, because I just wanted to add one, one observation. Um, 
I personally got involved with quite a lot of police development and capacity building in, in Bosnia and Kosovo. And there comes a level in the development of a police force where actually being able to do big operations and being able to do it on their own becomes quite important to them. And when they can pull it off, it's the most enormous boost for confidence, particularly for the middle management and the senior leadership. And my suspicions are, with the successful policing of the two Afghan pop concerts attended by tens and thousands of people from across southern Afghanistan in Lashkagar, actually that, that will have been quite an institutional confident, confidence builder. Um, could I just say that I'm very, very grateful to our two real, as opposed to our virtual, uh, speaker um, for the insight they've given us. And um, quite clearly, as, as Desmond Byrne said, there's an awful lot of catching up that's had to be done uh, from the early years when various opportunities seem to have been missed by the international community in Afghanistan. But I think you've got an excellent insight of um, the way the UK is trying to take this thing forward against a very challenging timeline. So will you join me in thanking the two? <laughs>